here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is Kathy Kriski, Commodity Strategist at Invesco. So we are talking about the outlook for commodities and some of them have been very hot lately. Cocoa prices have more than tripled over the past year, much to the consternation of chocolate lovers. Gold prices also recently hit an all-time high. Copper, aluminium, coffee, they have been surging. Oil prices also rose a lot uh, recently. So investors are looking at commodities again. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Kathy. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. It's I'm so happy to be here, especially as you mentioned on a time where we're back. Commodities yeah. are back. <laughs> right, right. Let's start with the investment case for commodities because you mentioned commodities are back uh, and uh, commodities had, in fact, earlier significantly outperformed stocks and bonds in 2022. Mm-hmm. And that time, commodity ETFs were quite popular, but last year's stocks surged. So everyone was focused on the Magnificent Seven stocks and other growth stocks, and the investors just lost interest in commodities. And commodity ETFs, in fact, saw outflows last year. Now they are looking at commodities again because these some, some of these commodities have been soaring and also because of rising geopolitical risks and stickier inflation, stickier than earlier anticipated inflation. Uh, so many investors are looking at commodities as an inflation hedge too. So could you talk and walk us through the case for including commodity ETFs, the role of commodity ETFs in an investment portfolio? Fantastic. Okay. So I love that you built the background. So you're right um, in 2022, but let's go back 2021, right? 2021 and 2022, commodities were the best performing asset class. But then you're right, last year, 2023, we were down slightly. So our main product, um, the, the one that's very popular, PDBC, Papa Delta Bravo Charlie, right? It was, it finished the year last year down about um, 6%, right? But as I said, we're back. So PDBC up 7% just year to date, right? And what is the alter- What is the case for alternatives like commodities? I know that most investors focus on that 60-40 and they don't want to hear about alternatives. But you were right in saying there were um, 22 when um, a lot of equities and fixed income were causing a lot of problems. We had so many clients in the um, our commodities and the the story I heard over and over again was, well, Kathy, you told me to put 5% in commodities or that was a suggested allocation. And just that 5%, rather than being down 30% for my whole portfolio, I was up 5% with only a small allocation to commodities. Um, and so that's where I think where we earn our weight, right? And again, we do tend to recommend about a 5% allocation, but you know, you mentioned it, inflation hedging and you said sticky inflation, which is a perfect description of what's going on, right? We, the whole idea about getting back to 2% is challenging, right? So we keep seeing these numbers higher than the the Fed is targeting. So this inflation is here. Now, there are some out there that have pointed to, um, Larry Summers talks about what happened in the um, mid 70s and then early 80s, where inflation came all the way down and then it went right back up and went even higher. So I had a client today actually say, and we were talking about inflation and she said, I'm actually worried about the Larry Summers scenario, pointing out what happened in um, history that this could happen again. Now, I am not predicting that, but as you said, it's going. We, we're sticky in the threes, um, and I think it's going to be challenging to get back to the twos. So the way that the math works out is that as long as CPI is above two percent, over seventy percent of the time, commodities have positive returns year on year, right? And there's a lot of people that talk about this commodity super cycle and all of that, but it is um, again we're. We had two years and then a basically flat to slightly down. But I am a believer that we're back on track for commodities to have good returns. So, and again, inflation, while it is one of the 
big motivators. It's also um, diversification. And I've been calling 2024 the year of uncertainty because there is so much, so many crazy things going on. One, all of these elections. It's not just a U.S. election right there. 50 percent of the globe has major elections this year. So we have that. We have wild weather, not just from global warming, but these shifts from La Nina to El Nino. So that is greatly impacting things. And two wars, right? The geopolitics, as you mentioned before, affecting energy. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So as a diversifier, like commodities tend to be a good hedge for times of uncertainty. And then just lastly, returns. A lot of investors like, I don't care what it is. I just want to buy something that's going up, right? And so that's why I think like this should be a good year for returns for commodities. Excellent. So we'll be discussing the outlook for some of the major commodities today and some major commodity groups. But I wanted to ask you if investors should be looking for the commodity group with the best outlook or should they be placing bets on individual commodities or uh, they should just get diversified exposure to the entire asset class with ETFs? So I'm a little conflicted with this question because you know, I have two children like, okay, do you have a favorite child? Like, do I have a favorite Mm -hmm. sector or even a favorite commodity? And actually right now I sort of do. I I actually love industrial metals right now. Um, But before I go into that, I I did want to say for investors that are not interested in doing like the deep research and really tracking some of these individual sectors, it is safer, right, to do broad-based, right? So we have those broad-based indices that have the three sectors, the energy, the metals, and the agriculture, right? So I'd say if you're not very familiar with commodities. Um, you might want to start broad based, but we totally accept the um, people that want to go either to a sector like industrial metals or to an individual commodity, right? My only pet peeve is a lot of people just go to gold, right? And we're going to talk about gold, but I right now, and gold is wonderful, right? For a lot of reasons, but I think that sometimes it's better to diversify a few um, amongst a few commodities, but just like on industrial metals. We have a product DBB, so Delta Bravo Bravo, and it is just copper, aluminum, and zinc, equally weighted on the rebalance. Um, And I have to say, there's been a lot of excitement because a lot of these industrial metals have trended down for the past few years, right? Because with the China um, building sector not coming back as fast as everyone had hoped, um, and just that word recession, I think people hear recession and they sell like copper or they sell industrial metals. And I understand that. But remember, we haven't had a recession here in the U.S., yet people have been trading their portfolios assuming that the the recession was coming. So I'm in the camp of I don't think we're going to have a recession. And that's one of the reasons why I actually really like these industrial metals. So, and we are a bit in a bit um, of a copper crisis right now because some of the copper refiners and the smelters are cutting their supply and their capex. So we, um, and we have this almost ever increasing demand for copper, especially because of the energy transition, right? Rebuildings of the grids. And that's why even looking at China, China um, used a lot of copper last year, rebuilding their grids. And in the U.S., right, we are only starting to do that. So part of the energy transition is a a big demand for industrial metals. So that's why I do like this DBB product. I do like it. But again, if you are not super familiar with all the different um, areas, you might want to go broad based, like I said, PDBC or DBC. Right. So you mentioned the copper being used in energy transition. I read that it is also being used a lot in data centers and AI. Yes. And yes. that demand has suddenly exploded. And yes. uh, we got the results from some of the mega cap technology companies in the past few days, and they are spending billions on those data centers. So that demand, you think, will continue to explode? Uh, exactly. So- Okay, that's that's really interesting. So that's the main reason why copper and uh, copper has been going up and other industrial metals uh, because of the energy transition and demand from EVs and also the global economic rebound and the recession, which never happened, right? <laughs> right. And um, again, a lot of analysts are calling for almost a doubling in prices, right? Um, so we're at nine, over 9,000 now for copper. Um, and people are saying we could go to 15 to 18 like in the next year or so. And that's what I've been saying to clients for the past 
gosh, six months, that industrial metals is a good long-term hold, right? Because like you said, the the build-outs due to AI demand and the EVs and the grids and all of that, um, and just the constraint on supply. So that is, the thing that you always want to buy in the commodity world is where you have increasing demand, but constrained supply. That's why energy was so great as we came out of COVID, right? People all started driving everywhere. The number one um, commodity when we were coming out of COVID was gasoline. People drove in Instead of um, flying, like they and they just they didn't drive to work, but they drove everywhere else, right? So now I think that this is the story. I love copper, I like aluminum, and I like zinc. Um, but I think that this is an area that deserves people's attention. Very interesting. So from industrial metals, let's move on to precious metals uh, <laughs> because gold prices have also been surging yes. lately this year. And it seems that uh, this demand is driven largely by record purchases by central banks all yes. over the world, particularly in emerging markets. And consumers in China have also been buying a lot of gold because they have yes. been burned by their real estate and stock, domestic stock investments. And you talked about uh, rising geopolitical risks and uh, persistent inflation. So gold is seen as a hedge against, uh, you know, inflation. And also it is seen as a safe haven asset. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about this recent surge in gold prices? And do you think this rally can continue? Great. And you sort of said a lot of the things that's happening, right? So the two reasons why gold is going up now or has been for the past few months is, as you said, central bank buying, but it's from the emerging markets. So countries like India, Turkey, Poland, uh, Singapore, China, right? A lot of central bank buying. And so that's why I used to say to clients, central bank buying doesn't necessarily push prices up as much as it provides a floor, but now it has gotten really dramatic. So it is absolutely pushing prices higher. So, um, and again, why do central banks buy gold, right? It's a move to de-dollarize, right? When um, a lot of the people worry if there's um, issues with the U.S. and that the U.S. might, um, you know, they're considered an enemy of the U.S. and, you know, we might confiscate their U.S. assets, right? So they want to de-dollarize and a big move in de-dollarizing is to put your reserves in gold. So that's made it's very attractive. And then the other thing you mentioned, right, was the physical buying of gold, right, for jewelry, but just gold bars and gold coins. I was laughing the other day because Costco, you know, is selling gold bars. And um, I, I actually haven't bought gold bars from Costco, but on my next trip, I'm certainly going to ask about it. <laughs> but I think, to, again, the average person, right, and and you said it very well, like, why do people like to buy gold? It's a, it's a safe haven um, thing. As people don't like trusting their fiat currency, right, and they're worried about out, um, the devaluation of currencies, they want to own gold. So that's right. Um, and um, I I love gold too as just generally this safe haven. I always say to investors, if you're so worried about the world and what is going on that you want to hide under your bed, then you need to hold gold, right? But um, I actually, I don't love gold as an inflation hedge because when we had all that inflation, when it went up the CPI up to 9%, like gold didn't perform well. So I think what's motivating gold is different, but remember, Remember, what we've all been waiting for is when is the Fed going to start easing, right? Lowering rates. And that always stimulates gold prices. So think about it. We've hit historic highs on gold without the Fed easing. So I think that this has definitely um, another leg higher to go um, as we um, wait for the Fed. Now, again, everyone has their different views of when this is going to happen. Um, and I am not a Fed expert, but as we get closer to more certainty about when that's going to happen, that will be very good for gold as well. So as I said, safe haven, central bank buying, um, and the Fed easing, all good reasons to hold gold. Now let's talk about digital gold, right? Bitcoin <laughs> is often called digital gold. And this is this has been a great year for Bitcoin. Bitcoin prices have surged this year, mainly mm. because of the launch of spot Bitcoin ETFs. And there was so much demand for those ETFs and Bitcoin demand for Bitcoin from those ETFs that prices surged. They have come down a little bit in the past few weeks. And uh, we understand uh, that Bitcoin underwent 
halving uh, recently. So yes. I was interested in your thoughts on holding Bitcoin as a commodity um, investment in their portfolio. And also, what is your outlook for Bitcoin post halving? All right. Great questions. And you're right. We were one of the issuers launching um, a spot Bitcoin ETF. Our ticker is BTCO, as in Bravo, Tango, Charlie, Oscar. Um, my son's in the military, so I always have to do that military, you know, letters. <laughs> um, but um, so and, it, and it's been exciting. Right. But I think a lot of the run up in prices was the excitement around these uh, Bitcoin, uh, the 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 launch of the ETFs. So again, there was a little over exuberance, and then when, as you said, when they launched, they were, we were up for a few days, and then we went down. Um, but that question and, and what we went through just now with commodities and what investors go through and like adding alternatives. So this is a brand new alternative. I know a lot of people have already held um, Bitcoin in their digital wallets, you know, and set that up. Um, but now in the form of an ETF to actually put it in your investment portfolio has been, you know, more easily accessible, right? And so that's got a lot of excitement around it. Um, and that's what we've partnered with Galaxy, who's a digital expert. And that has been really amazing for us. Because, and again, I've done commodities for 30 years and I'm at Invesco and um, one of the senior people is like, Kathy, you do, com you do commodities. Um, Bitcoin's considered a commodity. So we want you to handle this uh, Bitcoin launch. Are you, excuse me? You know, like I said, my son owns Bitcoin, but I haven't bought it. So they're like, okay. And so we, my colleague Lucy and I have been in, we call crypto college for the past nine months, learning everything we can. And being a partner with Galaxy has been a game changer for us because they are experts. So they, they've they been teaching us everything and we've been having a, a lot of fun working with them. But, you know, again, there's a lot of misconceptions about Bitcoin. And I joke about this whole adoption as you know, for the um, people that haven't had this in their portfolio before. And the first reaction I get from a lot of investors is, um, wow, it's really volatile. And then I just put the question to them. I was like, well, what do you think the volatility is? I'm like, oh, I don't know, 100, 150. I was like, wow, okay. The actual volatility is 47%. I said, and do you know what the volatility for natural gas is? I said, it's 90%. So pretty much double what Bitcoin is. And that always shocks people to put it in context. Because yes, when Bitcoin first was created, it was very volatile. But with all this um, adoption, volatility has come down. So I think it's becoming more palatable. And that's where we say like, yes, does it belong in your alts? But what we've looked at, um, so Galaxy did um, this great asset allocation um, analysis. And they said, to, to just getting off zero is a big thing. So getting off zero, going from zero to just 1%, uh, that actually has the best risk-adjusted return. And they had looked at where you would take it from, and they said actually taking it from equities. So as we've been out there talking to investors, I said, would you notice 1% out of equities? And like, nah, pretty much not. But then to put that 1% into Bitcoin, we believe, as I said, that makes sense to just get um, clients off zero. So now you mentioned the having. So this was very exciting, right? Last week. Um, and it was sort of like that event that happened and then nothing, right? There was nothing. And, and a lot of people that are digital experts said, don't expect anything initially. So we looked again at the math and that usually a year before the halving, um, the market has gone up in the past. So there's already been three halvings, right? And so this is the fourth. And on, um, But in past halvings, beforehand, it's gone up around 200%. But usually like a year after the halving, it is on um, historically has gone up 2000%. So that's why people, you know, we were joking about like, okay, I have a year to wait to see if I make like $2,000 on this BTCO investment. Um, but again, it is, you know, when you think about supply and demand, which is how we are trained in commodities, right? We're always focusing on supply and demand. If you apply that same ideology to Bitcoin, right? What did the having do? Right, There were 900 Bitcoin created every day. And then as of last weekend, it got cut to 450. So right away, like less Bitcoin available every day. And then think about the demand just coming from these spot ETFs. It's over 3,700 a day of Bitcoin that is being bought for these. Um, so again, that supply demand fundamental, we do not have, a, we have increasing demand and we do not have enough supply. So that's why I am 
cautiously bullish. Like I said, I, you know, we're in the 60s. I would, you know, I think it's possible to see, you know, 100,000 um, by um, year end. But again, this is not something that you bet the bank on, right? This is, we're saying that going from zero to a 1% allocation um, makes sense. And as we believe the, um, for us, we have this partnership with Galaxy that has been a tremendous help for us. So that's why we did not have the hubris and say, Invesco, we're doing this on our own. And Galaxy, they also could have done it on their own. So we are, let's come together, let's do this together um, and and launch this um, Bitcoin ETF. So it's been very exciting. Right. So this is a new asset class. So cautiously optimistic and 1% allocation makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned supply demand dynamics for Bitcoin. Another commodity that has benefited this year from supply disruptions is oil. Uh, In fact, uh, oil prices shot up earlier this month mainly due to escalating uh, tensions in the Middle East. And uh, Brent crude topped $90 per barrel then. And many experts have been talking about oil prices rising above $100. Lately, over the past two weeks or so, oil prices have come down a little bit. Energy is still the best performing sector year to date. It's up about 15%. So could you talk about this demand supply imbalance in oil and uh, also your outlook for oil? Right. That's a great question. And this is the sort of issue. So we know it's all about, again, the supply and demand, right? So OPEC plus has decreased their supply, right? So Saudi's only putting in like 9 million barrels per day. Russia is Russia is part of OPEC plus. They've even said that they're going to be cutting back their production. So we they've been rolling these cuts, right? So they've been disciplined. So hence, you know, prices and usually their goal is to have in the, you know, for Brent, like in the mid 80s. But who is overproducing? It's us, right? In the US, we hit record where over 13 million barrels per day. So Saudi at nine, us at over 13 million, right? And then Canada, massive production, Brazil, Guyana. There's a lot of places that we have um, the the ex-OPEC or non-OPEC countries where we're seeing loads of supply coming on. So we are still tight. And that's what we're constantly, the number that we work with in the oil world is like 100 million barrels per day, right? So that's, the market tends to be balanced around that. We're 100 million for demand, 100 million for supply. So whenever people say, well, we're going to, we're expecting like 1.5% increase in demand, we're like, well, if the supply is not increasing like that, then we are going to have higher prices. But right now, there's a lot of, it's going to take a lot for this to break into the triple digits. And I have to be honest, I, as you know, love commodities, but nobody likes triple digit oil, right? It scares everyone. And then we get too much attention. And then government's like, wait, what are you oil people doing? You know, so, um, but uh, triple digit oil is really, um, you know, people get nervous around that. And so, and remember, we're in a big election year now, right? And the current administration, right? Right. I think Biden was very frustrated that he got labeled as the inflation president. And he released a lot of the SPR, our strategic petroleum reserve, um, to move prices down. And it worked, right? Gasoline was cheaper at the pump. Now, he knows everybody's going to be going into the polls to vote. And if they go to that pump and they are in pain because the prices are so much higher, that that will not be good for whoever's in office, right? So that's why I think that there's, you know, while there was moves to sort of um, allow uh, Venezuela to export more. Even there's there's sanctions against Iran, and we are not enforcing those sanctions, right? And so the idea is that, you know, if these geopolitics actually remove barrels, yes, we could see very large moves. But currently, with all the geopolitics, it's not removing barrels from the market. Again, back to the supply and demand. So yes, are people nervous? And that's why we've been seeing sometimes um, moves up in energy on the weekends because traders don't want to go over the weekend um, short. So they like get flat, right? If they're short, they get flat. And people want to go into a weekend long when there's geopolitics that and you can't trade this market you know, for that weekend period. So again, there is concern about geopolitics, but until we see actual barrels come Coming off the market due to the geopolitics, I don't think we're going to see higher prices. But uh, and th- but there's a lot of tension. Remember, this is very rare for Iran to directly attack Israel. So not through their um, we call them the three H's, right? Hezbollah, Houthi, 
and Hamas. So that was a very big deal that they directly attacked. Now, it was very choreographed, but, you know, they they did seek to cause harm, even though there was not much harm caused, at least loss of life. So this, if this in any way escalates in this tit for tat, yes, we could see barrels come off the market, or we could be more stringent in our enforcing of those sanctions on um, Iranian barrels and sanctioning the countries that are buying those barrels. But it's a great question, Nina, in terms of like, why aren't we at a triple digit with all this geopolitical concern? But I said, you got to go back to the supply and demand fundamentals. And right now, it's these geopolitical events are not pulling barrels off the market. That makes a lot of sense. Now, let's talk about two commodities which have been really hot lately, cocoa and coffee. Yes. <laughs> so uh, so this, uh, I read there's a global shortage in these commodities and that's mm. mainly caused by either weather-related reasons or some crop yields. Uh, so for cocoa, there have been much reduced crop yields in Africa and for coffee, hot and dry weather has caused disruptions in some Southeast Asian countries, which are major producers for coffee. So could you talk about uh, these shortages in uh, agricultural commodities and uh, how is that reflected in agriculture investing? So again, this has been a shock to the market. And e- every time we think there's going, it's going to calm down in cocoa, it doesn't, right? Each day, you know, I stare at that market and I get very nervous. So you're right. It was weather, but it was mostly disease. And these cocoa trees and plants, right, they, they they are they they can't be um, fixed. Like the situation can't be fixed. So they the trees have to be uprooted, and when they need to plant new trees. Now remember, the farmers, um, the actual cocoa farmers, were not um, participating in this big move of the price up. Right? They are paid very little money. Right? So a lot has to change, and I think some of that is changing. But this could take. And I hate to say it, but years, right? So, and that's why I said the the time of cheap cocoa is over officially. And I was um, recently talking to someone and they said, well, people are just going to have to switch to vanilla from chocolate. I was like, I will never do that. I'm a real chocolate lover. And I think that um, there will always be demand, but we are seeing like the shrinkflation, like things are getting smaller, um, but it it's going to be a problem. And we are waiting to see um, that... Um, as it stabilizes. But uh, again, this is going to be a long-term problem. And similar to cocoa, uh, to coffee, we were nervous when coffee started going up, like, because people started saying, oh, it's going to be another cocoa. And we're like, please, God, no. Um, So we have two, um, we have some products that have these um, cocoa and coffee. So this DBA, um, Delta Bravo Alpha, that's been around for a long time. It has the three sectors of agriculture, the greens, the softs, and the livestock. So it only rebalances once a year. So believe it or not, even though cocoa had a very small um, allocation initially when we rebalanced, the cocoa got up to over 20%, right? So a lot of people... When you were saying, oh, the energy's been the best performer, I was like, oh, I don't know, softs. Softs have been the best performer. Um, and because of that, you know, our DBA, people look at it and like, oh my goodness, how, why am I making so much money on DBA when there's grains in there, right? Because grains, we have record corn crops here from out of the US, right? and Russia's flooding the market with wheat, right? And soybeans haven't been that great either. Like, I thought I was buying like grains, but I, I didn't realize I had all three. And now, as I said, this DBA is one of our best performing commodity ETFs, even though, as you said, like our instinct is energy. But I, I, again, you have to be very careful about chasing moves up, right? So, um, and that's why I would say like, I don't know um, if this is a great time to buy DBA, but anyone who owns it that's on this call, you might be happy looking at your portfolio right now. Um, but it is hopefully the problem with coffee, you know, it will get sorted um, with the weather um, there. A lot of people have said like already the weather is starting to improve. So um, we are not as concerned long-term for coffee as we are long-term for cocoa. But I think it's going to have to be, you know, because supply will be limited long-term for cocoa, the demand has to give way. So I think that we are just, a lot of people are going to, you know, include um, less cocoa in things that are available for sale, as I said, like the shrinkflation. But it is a sad story, right? 
Yes, you won't believe how many questions I got from my friends and mm-hmm. some of our clients too about whether there's a, there's an ETF for Coco. But uh, sorry, ETF investors, there's no ETF which focuses exclusively on Coco because there was an ETN uh, which was liquidated by Bar- Barclays, I think, last year. So DBA is your best bet if you right. want to invest in Coco. But as as you mentioned, Cathy, it is never a good idea to chase performance or chase returns. So you mentioned 1% allocation to Bitcoin in a portfolio. How much exposure to all commodity do you recommend in a portfolio? Uh, you talked about diversification benefits. You talked about uh, mm-hmm. hedge against inflation and geopolitical risk. So keeping all those in mind, mm-hmm. how much exposure should investors have to commodity ETFs in a portfolio? Now I'm cautious, right? And so commodities are volatile, so that's why I um, I always lead with five percent. So what happened though in 21 and 22 was everyone put in their five percent, and then it grew so much, and they were not rebalancing. So people would come to calls with me. It's like Kathy, it's so great. I'm making so much money in commodities, and I'm up to 20 percent. I was like, dear God, right? So I said, you need to rebalance, right, and be disciplined. I know it's so hard to sell winners when they're winning, right? But but you, it, disciplined investors, I think five, maybe to eight, but people shouldn't have 20% of their portfolio in commodities, right? We are a volatile asset class. So while I love my commodities, I believe, you know, 5%, you know, that gets you there for your inflation hedging, gives you some diversification. If you really are confident, you know, maybe go up to 8%, but um, I think that it, that that really is enough because as I said, they're volatile and we have all these risks right now in the market, some of which will push commodities up, but some will not. As I said, some of those spec traders right they get um, flat going into the weekend when it comes on Monday and there's nothing that's worrying them they short it right so we can have some Mondays where the market's down substantially so again volatile market I think five maybe eight but basic five percent to commodities gets you where you need to be excellent stuff Kathy thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights my pleasure it was fun thanks Nina that was Kathy Krisky of Invesco. Now let's talk a little bit about EDFs that you could use for investing in commodities. And uh, she mentioned some of these EDFs. So for having broad diversified exposure to all commodities, the best option is PDBC by Invesco. And uh, this is an actively managed ETF, and this provides exposure to all commodity groups, including energy commodities, precious metals, industrial metals, and agriculture commodities. Now, if you want to invest only in agriculture commodities, which have been so hot this year, uh, she talked about the Invesco DB Agriculture Fund, the ticker symbol is DBA. DBA is an older fund. It has about $840 million in assets. Invesco also has a lower-priced version, newer, actively managed uh, version of this ETF. And the ticker symbol there is PD. BA. This is lower price, but it is also much smaller than DBB. Uh, she talked about base metals ETF. The ticker symbol there is DBB. Uh, so this will provide exposure to copper, aluminium, and zinc futures. We talked about investing in Bitcoin and having about uh, 1% exposure to Bitcoin. And she mentioned the Invesco Bitcoin ETF. Another ETF which is worth a look is by iShares. The ticker symbol is iBit, I-B-I-T. This is the most popular Bitcoin ETF. For investing in gold, the lowest price, best ETFs that I like for long-term focused investors are 
GLDM by State Street and IAUM by iShares. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting or tax advice or a recommendation to buy, sell or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.